Good morning, Southside Bible Church. Welcome. First time guests are always grateful to have anyone who comes and joins our family to gather on, on the Lord's Day and worship the living God. So we are glad to have you in our midst this morning. As we begin, I'm going to just start with a quick announcement and then we'll enter uh, into Romans. If you'll turn to Romans 14 while I'm, while I'm sharing, that will uh, kind of get us ahead. Uh, the Lord has answered our prayers and has moved us in a very unified front as to our next church plant. A few years back, Nick and Jackie launched from Southside to begin a church plant in Tijuana. And in the same spirit, our next plant is going to go across to the city in Lakewood. Our hope is to plant a church with a, a focus on multicultural, inner city, urban ministry. The Andreos and the Salinas, um, both who have served here as elders, are going to be launching out with some other families to begin this work. And Lord willing, we're going to begin this work in September of this year. So we have fev- several families in that area that, uh, who would like to be a part of this missional plant. And there's many families that that Mateo and, and some other brothers have ministered to over the years and working with these high school kids, kind of like big brothers working and shepherding them. So they, they've been there 12 years, and a lot of them have grown up and have families now, and it's just exciting how God has been laying this foundation for over a decade. So here's what is needed. I want to lay out a couple things. Is We, we need prayer. Mateo's uh, begging for this. We want to be a spirit-led group in all areas of our planning, our launching, and then being sustained by him in this ministry. There's going to be some costs that up front, there's a $30,000 startup cost, which is going to be uh, the rent. Uh, you got to have two months with lease, chairs, sound equipment, startup for the admin, furniture, tables, cribs, pulpit signs. You guys know the list. Currently, there's a building that we're looking at. With, that's a, it's a move-in ready for a church. There was a church that was leasing it before, so it's just got everything set up for it. It can seat up to 100 people. Very good price um, on Jewel and Wadsworth. Uh, we're going to need $4,000 a month, monthly budget for that space and the different costs and starting it up. Those who are going out are going to be bivocational, with the hope of one day maybe being supported full-time to shepherd the flock of God that will be entrusted to their care. And if anyone from this body who would want to come and serve in a pioneering role uh, that would want to help with worship, children's ministries, there's just a lot of needs in a church plant. Uh, if you'd be willing to give a one-year commitment, that would be a huge blessing uh, to this startup group. The hope is that the Lord would... would um, would cause a self-sustaining church in about a year from the launch. Um, how to give. How to give. There's going to be a giving option through Southside Online Giving. For either a one-time gift or a monthly support, it can be set up. There's a QC code. and Was that a typo? Is it QR, QC? I, I know nothing about technology. So if QC is right, go with it. If it's QR, I've heard that before. Um, that will be put on the screen. Um, and you can, you can, it'll take you directly to the site. And so that, that will come up. I don't know if it's now or at the end of the service, but it will uh, come up. So to God be the glory that he has a love uh, for this area in Lakewood. And he's been working in the hearts and calling those to go and sow the gospel um, with all their hearts. So we give God all the praise. Let me pray for that. Father, I pray for for Mateo and his family and Ray and his sweet bride, God, as they have been led by you to go do one of the greatest things we can do this side of glory, to plant a church, a church where Jesus Christ is the lampstand. He's taught, he's loved, he's worshiped, he's held up to to the lost, he's held up to hurting believers. God, thank you for the beauties of Christ and what you've done in these hearts. I thank you for all those who have been led to help. God, give them sweet unity now as as they begin moving in these next steps. God, help us all to pray over how can we help support them? How can we be prayer warriors on a consistent basis, Lord, for the outpouring of your spirit that you would blow through this area of North Denver? God, thank you uh, for all this. Protect 
protect them, put a hedge of protection, help them to put on the full armor of God and to stand firm against the schemes of the evil one. God, be with these dear brothers and sisters as they launch out in this high calling. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Romans 14. Um, I got good news. We are going to finish unless the rapture or I drop dead. Um, We're going to finish. So Romans 14, I'm praying that the gospel is transforming your heart uh, by what we're looking at. And as you look at the gospel, love to God and love to others. We've seen that worked out in our current section on, on Christian liberty. This area where we don't have commandments, but they're, they're all moral decisions, whether you eat meat or not, whether you drink wine or not. We're looking at these things. How do we handle our freedoms and our liberties in the Christian life and fulfill the law of Christ that we saw in Romans 13, 8 through 10? And this section has been beautiful to see the mind of God. What are his thoughts? How do we live together on these issues? And so I'm going to read just our section, and we'll finish it up um, this morning, verse 13. (laughs) Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you're no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So when we pursue, so then we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. The faith which you have, (coughs) have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. Let's pray. Father, help us to understand what by your Holy Spirit Paul has penned for us. Uh, Inerrant, perfect, God breathe. Lord, open our minds and our hearts to first to understand it, and then move in our hearts God, to where our affections are drawn and we begin to obey this in the body of Christ. Lord, help this. Help us. Help us, I pray, to comprehend now. Put yourself on display by what is our priority as the children of God. Do mighty things in every heart now as as we worship. And, And let us worship now in the Word of God together as your called out ones. And it's in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen. Our outline, we began in verses 13 through 16, is Paul says, be careful. And he's dealing with those who are strong, weak weak and strong on these convictions of the outworking of the gospel. Be careful how you use your freedoms is what he exhorted us. And what he basically said in verses 13 through 16 is, don't stumble a brother. Don't for your freedoms and your liberties in these areas, think about your brother. And, and the word to stumble was to, to hurt greatly, to harm. And so don't just run around saying, all that matters is my liberties and my freedoms and not care about your brothers and sisters in Christ. So be careful how you use your liberties and freedoms in this area. And then we looked at the hinge verse in verses 17 through 18, and that's kind of where we left off last week, and Paul just kind of brings us in this very narrow focus while you're talking about all these issues and says, let me tell you what really matters. Let's get our hearts on on the big things and not get off on all these other things in the Christian life and in the church. And so in verse 17, what, what is our focus, Paul? 
for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. Those aren't the issues. Now, we're learning that they matter, and he's teaching us why they matter, because they're big issues, how you handle these smaller issues. So it's not about those things, but it's about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And then in verses 19 through 23, he says, be constructive with your freedom, build one another up. And so I just want to kind of flush out where we left on the linchpin in verses 17 through 18. This is good. We, we've been transferred. I want you to hear this in the gospel in Colossians. We've been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. That's salvation. We're no longer in that, that dark realm where flesh rules and sin and Satan. We now come into the kingdom of light. And we forget this all too often in the middle of this life because we still live in the old kingdom. We still live here on this earth where Satan is the god of this world and the darkness is all over. And we're just these beautiful new creations, but we are still in it until we die or Jesus returns. And so the miners seem to, to always get the float at, at the church parade in our everyday lives. We, we, we like eating and drinking and those issues, and we can get drawn into them, and we can drift and just start to live for the scene. Christians just forget that the just shall live by faith, and all it is is what I see, what I eat, what I can touch, what I drink. And we get caught up in eating and drinking and entertainments and jobs and our homes and our liberties. And so in the middle of <coughs> divisions and fights in the church of Rome, where they're judging one another, they're looking down on one another, and they're not receiving one another with these issues. They're, they're straining the gnats while they're swallowing camels, the law of love. They're caught up in the minors while missing the major things about the kingdom of God. It is so easy to get off focus. Colossians this morning was beautiful. To set your mind on the things above. And just so the question is, could we be doing the same thing as you sit here this morning? And I just want you in the quietness of your heart, are you all stirred up about lesser things? Is, is it just all the lesser things what have your heart and taking you away? Or is it these things that Paul's about to narrow down what the kingdom of God is really about? This is holy ground. What are we to be about as the church of God? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what Christ died for. Not so much for whether you can have a glass of wine or not or eat meat or not, but for these things. So whatever has your heart this morning, I just ask, is it consistent with the kingdom of God? What has taken up your life and your thoughts? <laughs> Where are you at? Do you have peace and joy? Those are usually the markers that show you if you're getting off the big things and getting on to the, to the major things. The majors are all that we have in Jesus Christ. We spent 11 chapters looking at that diamond of all that we have in Christ. Jesus looked at the Pharisees and said, you tithe mint and cumin, while you're ignoring the weightier matters like justice and mercy, the law of Christ. You, you got your little list, but you've lost the heart and essence of Christianity with love. You, you love your Christian liberties, but you don't love your brethren. And so what usually leads us away from this kingdom that we're going to narrow in, what, what leads us away from it? And it's a pretty simple answer. It, it's our kingdom. What, what gets me off of this thing that Paul's going to just narrow it down. What leads me away is it's, it's my kingdom. I start worrying about my kingdom, and I get lost in all these lesser things. My, my pet practices and my pre, pet doctrines, and I just get on those, and, and how you do child training, and, and your foods, and your drinks, and we lose what really matters. We, we lose the forest for the trees, and then we just love all our rules and all our specifics. We even try to help God with his rules and give him some more. But this hill called agape, I just won't climb. I won't climb the, the death of self that now lives to love God and love others. I just keep bringing it back, Paul, to what Christianity is. We are a chosen race, 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We want to show the world what the kingdom of God is all about, fighting over meat and all these feuds and cliques in our own kingdom. The kingdom of God is just forgotten. The kingdom of God is let's advance it. I've said for 25 years, let it begin with me. Let's advance the kingdom. And I want you to look at what characterizes this kingdom where we left off last time. Righteousness. I want to be about his kingdom. And when I think of his kingdom, the first thing that comes to my heart is is righteousness. It's the same word that Paul has been using throughout this epistle. And you'll remember back to when we started four years ago. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God to bring people into salvation, first for the Jew and then the Greek. He says, for in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. So this is a gospel where it was what's called a subjective genitive, that it's a God kind of righteousness. So there's a gospel where you can get a God kind of righteousness put to your account. It isn't you go work yourself up, do your own righteousness and get accepted. We have a gospel where a God kind of righteousness is given to you by faith not by your works. It's the whole whole foundation of everything. Righteousness. It's an alien righteousness, not my own, and it comes to us, and we're wrapped in it, in the righteous garment of Christ, and we stand now in his presence, accepted and loved. We get justified, declared righteous. This kingdom's about his righteousness given to you, and you are declared righteous. You stand before God right now, believer in Christ, absolutely righteous. The God of the universe says justified. No one else can come and attack it or charge it. No one can bring a new charge and God say, oh, I didn't know about that sin. He knows everything when he said not guilty. Just live into that. Love it. That's what the kingdom of God is about. Love that. All of life is lived from that fruit. And what we've been learning in Romans then is that produces righteousness. So his righteousness, put to my account, declaring me righteous, begins to produce righteousness now in my life, and not the pharisaical kind that I just do all the externals. I give you a new heart, and now love starts to well up from within, and and righteousness begins to come out into my life. Matthew 6, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. This cross, you die to sin and now you live to righteousness. That's what the kingdom's about. I'm alive and I live and I pursue righteousness. Timothy said, flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness faith, love, and peace with those who call upon the Lord from a pure heart. The kingdom of God is about pursuing righteousness because God's given you his and declared you righteous. What a beautiful kingdom. Why do you worry about lesser things when you have that? The whole kingdom is just built upon righteousness. And so don't major on the things that distract you from true righteousness but be concerned about your conformity to Christ. And the second thing this kingdom about is peace. And you'll remember all the way back to Romans 5.1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. And we were at a, an eternal war with God. And, and God's heart was against us. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So God is against us. And we're against God because we want to be God. And, and we, just, we just will fight him and resist him and deny all that he asks. There, there's just this a warfare that will go on for eternity. Except God sent the, the white flag into the world, the, the way to have peace in this war And I love it because it took care of both problems. Jesus goes up on a cross and God pours out his full wrath for all of our sin for trying to be God. And he takes it and he bears it and and 
God's heart now is, is free, so to speak. And ours looks at the cross and says, how could the Son of God hang on a tree and take what only I deserved? And we, we look at that and suddenly the war's over in my heart against God. I'm, I'm now in love with Him and at peace and I want to pursue Him in righteousness so now we have peace with God. Praise be to God for the, our Lord Jesus Christ. And then you get the peace of God. Paul said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And I want you to hear this, the peace of God, not peace with God. The peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This kingdom now is I can have the peace of God because I'm forgiven, I'm accepted, he's my father, I'm adopted and I can now look at life in a whole new way in peace. I'm a child of God. And then it produces peace with others. You won't be about all your differences on these issues, all your disputes, and all your factions. This kingdom brings harmony. It brings harmony. Listen to verse 5 and 6 of Romans 15. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he takes away the enmity between us and God, and the dividing line between Jew and Gentile comes down, and in Christ we come together in peace and one. That's what the kingdom of God is about. And then he says, joy in the Holy Spirit. We get righteousness, a God kind of righteousness is put to our account. By the work of Jesus Christ, we get peace. And what comes after wartime? You know, when you come home from serving, joy. I'm come, I, I'm, it's over. Come home. The joy of being in Christ. This is an experienced gladness. I, I have this favorite phrase in the, in, the, in the Bible that I just come back to again and again, and it's just simple. The psalmist goes, Oh God, you're my God. Just simple, huh? Oh God, you're my God. Let joy flow like a river. You're sitting here this morning with righteousness justified, peace with God. Oh God, you're my God. You don't walk around like Eeyore. Let joy flow not on your circumstances and what's going on, but on that. Oh God, you're my God. If someone were to have watched you for the last year, it's the Holy Spirit producing joy in all of your difficulties. How about despite your difficulties? You know what I've learned in my short journey is legalists have no joy because they don't get righteousness. And they don't have joy, and they don't have peace because they're too busy looking down on everyone else who's not as good as them. And you just, you just won't find it. Christian liberty brawlers have no joy. There's the police to make sure everybody keeps my conscience issues, and they're never happy. There's not joy. Because it just until everyone lives and thinks and agrees with all my liberty issues, I can't be happy. Great test. <clears throat> Is there something this morning taking your joy away? And I, I've wrestled with this all week because the answer for me was, was yes to my shame. Is there something this morning taking your joy away? Can I remind you what the kingdom of God is about this morning? This joy that I have, the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. Remember what the kingdom of God is is about. And it's all in the Holy Spirit. Because you can say, I don't know how to have joy in the middle of this. I don't either. I don't know how to have peace when all this is going on. In the Holy Spirit. Lift, it should lift you because your flesh can't produce it. And there's a reason you can't get there. And so God takes it away 
So we come to the Holy Spirit. In the Holy Spirit, he reveals Christ. He shows us. He's a floodlight on Christ. And he shows us, you're righteous. You're declared righteous before God. You have peace with God. And joy are all rooted in the work of the Holy Spirit showing us Romans 1 through 11 and what Jesus Christ has done for us. It's done. They're indicatives. Look at them. Live into them. Believe them. He's the one who produces this. You, you want to, you, <laughs> he, he produces this. Are you with me? I got enough time for a shortcut. Flip out, just a, a, a little detour. Go to Ephesians 4. And I think this is worthy for all of us to examine our hearts. <clears throat> The Spirit is the one who produces. What's the fruit of the Spirit? The whole chapter is about love and joy and peace. And this is what the Holy Spirit produces in his believers as he shows us Christ. But what gets in the way of that in Ephesians 4 is interesting. In verse 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth but only such a word as is good for edification, which is what we're looking at. How do we build each other up? Don't, don't, the unwholesome word, it's, it's the Greek word for rotten fish. You know, anyone ever smelt that? That's what our speech is. It's like rotten fish filling up the room, but but only a word for edification according to the need of the moment. So it gives grace to those who hear. I'm so filled with grace. I want to speak grace. I want to bring it in and sow it everywhere I can. And then listen to verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. There's a connection right there that we're grieving the Spirit with this unwholesome speech that, that just isn't healthy. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You house the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy of Holies within you. And he's saying, don't grieve him with this unwholesome speech. And in verse 31 then, let all your bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Stop grieving the Spirit. So what should I be? Be kind to one another. Tender-hearted. Forgiving each other. We're never going to be able to dwell together without forgiving each other because we're not in glory yet. Newsflash. Forgiving each other. How? Just as God in Christ also has forgiven us. And so righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit. He gives me these fruits as he shows me what Jesus Christ is, has done, will do. And, and they come out and I can grieve it. I can grieve it, and, and, and I'm not going to be filled with those things, with my tongue, with my mouth. John Murray said, when questions of food and drink become your chief concern, then it's apparent how far removed from the interest of God's kingdom our thinking and conduct have strayed. It's a drift from the kingdom of God. Verse 18, he gives a commendation if you'll look with me. This is beautiful. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So everything we, we've been learning in this chapter, the one who serves God this way is acceptable to God. He's pleasing to God. Do you remember back to Romans 12, uh, 12 1, or 12, 2? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and pleasing and perfect. So now you can prove what the will of God is, what's good and acceptable and perfect, and that's what we're looking at this morning. And he's saying that this is what's pleasing to God. And then he goes and says, and as you do it, you'll be approved by men, testing your mettle. You're going to be real McCoys to other people. So it says that your, your behavior, the stumbling block, is going to cause others to blaspheme because of the way you're using your liberties. And now when you use them right, instead of unbelievers blaspheming, they're praising God. So one is they're going to blaspheme God, or the other they're going to praise Him by the way we handle and deal and love each other on these issues. 
The kingdom will be advanced by what they see. So the world will not be impressed by seeing how free we are, what we can eat and drink. I just want them to see how free I am. No, you want to show them this part of the kingdom, righteousness, peace, joy. How loving we are to one another as we differ on these issues. And I want to close out with our third point in verses 19 through 23. Be constructive with your freedoms, he says, instead of tearing each other down, build each other up with these freedoms that we have. So come with me to verse 19. (coughs) So then, we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. So if this is what the kingdom of God is about, we're, we're going to pursue these things. And I love this Greek word for pursue. It's the word for persecute. What do you do when you persecute someone? You just follow them. You hunt them down. You're going hard after them. And he's now coming and saying, you need to persecute for that which builds up, that which makes for peace. Hunt it down. Go after it. And the building up of one another, the word for build up meant to erect a building. God's building his church with the weaker and the stronger in it. And we're to build up one another, not criticizing and despising one another. So catch this. God has given us gifts that we saw at the beginning of Romans 12. He's given us graces to love without hypocrisy. And he's given us liberties. And they're all to be used to build up the saints. You see in a common thread. 1 Corinthians the, the, in the church there, the gifts became, I just want the showy gifts. I want people to notice what I can do. They're, they're fighting and arguing for the flashier gifts. And Paul says, the gifts are for building up the body of Christ, not you. First Corinthians 14 says, don't seek for the gifts that puff you up, but build others up. And so our freedom is to build up. And so a good question in regards to our liberty is will this tend to the peace and the building up of the body of Christ? John Murray again says, a loveless branding of liberty tears down. 1 Corinthians 10, 23, all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Build up. I must consider the body of Christ. And then verse 20, negatively stated, don't tear down the work of God. For the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they're evil for the man who eats and gives offense. Don't tear down the work of God. He's building his kingdom. He's building his temple stone by stone, weak and strong people in it. He says, don't rip that down for the sake of food. The work of God. He's poured out his grace upon us. He began a good work in every believer. He's at work in us. Are you the wrecking ball knocking down what God's building? What a terrible thing to spend your days doing. Don't tear it down. Build up the kingdom of God, the temple of God. Don't knock stones off like a wrecking ball for food. Don't hurt the saints. Don't hurt what God is doing in your brother or sister in Jesus Christ for a non-essential freedom. And then he repeats what we looked at last week. Look with me in verse 20. All things indeed are clean, but they're evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother (coughs) stumbles. And so all things are clean on these issues. There's not right or wrong. And he's just saying that your attitude and your heart, again, are what make this wrong. The meat is clean. I think if I had to summarize it, he's saying the meat is clean, but your heart isn't in what you're eating and how you're treating the brethren. And so this this I wrestled with a simple question. Have you ever given up anything you had a right to do for a believer in Christ? One time. And if the answer is no, you're not thinking the way Paul wants us to renew our minds. Have I ever given up something that I could do or partake of in a liberty for the sake of a brother or sister in Christ. And as we close this argument out, it's going to come now to a head. And verses 22 through 23 is kind of our summary. And Paul says, consider the conscience. And he says, the faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. So I'll make sure you hear that. The faith that you have, have as your own conviction 
before God. And that's what we've been working on is to make sure you get your convictions before God. And, and the first 12 verses of this chapter is in, in these liberty issues, consider how to please God or please Christ. And then the second half in these liberty issues is how do I love my brother? Does that sound familiar? It's the law of Christ. So I want you to just keep seeing how this all works together. So we have a carnal desire to flaunt our liberties, to show them, to display it. I just want everybody to know it. No, you don't, you don't, you don't want to help the church. Keep it to yourselves unless asked. Keep it to yourselves and, and don't just put it out, jump into their territory and give it to them. And I love this. Listen to this. Happy is he who does not condemn himself and what he approves. What a great conclusion. Blessed. It's the word blessed. A condition before God where you're approved and you're happy. Uh, the, the one, one translation is to be envied. You're, you're envied because of this beautiful place that you are. You do not condemn yourself and what you approve on these issues. You know that all things are lawful. And all things, I have a clear conscience as I eat or drink or, or celebrate holidays and different things. I can be blessed. So Paul's working, child of God, for you to be blessed, to live in this happy state before God. This is the gift of God. I was reading in Hebrews that the sacrifices in the Old Testament could not cleanse the conscience fully. It just couldn't cleanse the conscience and you've studied his word now, and, and we've looking at the law written in your heart, and it's worked out in the body of Christ, and all of us have been calibrating our consciences to learn what I approve, disapprove. We're all growing, but we're living according to the word and how our conscience works. And Paul says, I, I have a clean or a clear conscience, and nothing will feel as good as giving up a true freedom for the good of a weaker brother or sister in Christ. I had a, a dear brother last week come up after the sermon, or when I was pulling out of the parking lot, and he shared he was at a church, and, and his wife grew up um, a, a teetotaler in a family that, that alcohol just wasn't a part of it. And they would go to this couple's house after church, and, and, and the beer was pulled out, and they were drinking it, and, and, and the wife is in no way a legalist. She's not condemning. She's just saying, it, it, it's, it's hard. It, it's hard for me to be around that. And he shared it with this brother, and he said, you will never see a beer bottle in this house again. And he said, he used to drink out of a cup you couldn't see through, so I don't know what he was doing, but I never saw a beer bottle again. <laughs> I love it. If that hurts your wife, gone. That's the love of Christ. Blessed. What a blessing to walk before God with a good conscience, not just in these areas, but commandments. All, there's just, you can't have a greater blessing than just a clear conscience of living before God, not doubting what is pleasing to him in these issues. You, you're just walking and obeying and, and you're just, man, my conscience is clear before you, God. That's a blessing to walk in this. And most cannot be at peace unless everyone's walking the way I believe. But oh, how happy is this person who doesn't walk in guilt. He's not violating his conscience or her conscience. Happy are you that you're not denying yourself to not hurt or harm your brother and sister for whom Christ died. What this could do for the body of Christ is so beautiful. So quick question. I think this is important as we close out and then in a few weeks, <clears throat> we're going to address this deeper. What do you do when you violate your conscience? So this is probably the biggest struggle in, in, in the world and even in the church is I want to live with a clear conscience before God, but what do I do when I sin and it's, it's going off? How do I get rid of that guilt? Guilt, guilt, shame. And you're like, I, I need to get rid of that. And what is the world's answers? Blame shift. Um, it's your fault. So you, you're the reason I'm acting this way or did this. Or you can lie to yourself and say, that, that wasn't wrong. But your conscience has been trained and informed by the Word of God, and it keeps saying, it's wrong, it's wrong. And you're, no, it, we're just friends. <laughs> you just keep going there. And, and uh, no, you know what my problem is? It's, it's my parents. That's why I'm this way. You would have done the same thing under that kind of pressure. You can medicate it. You can take illicit drugs. You can use alcohol. There's, you can sear it. 
But the question this morning is, what do I do with my guilty conscience? And if you're sitting here this morning with a guilty conscience and it's gnawing at you and you're trying religion to clean it, it, it won't fix it. It's like the Old Testament. It can't cleanse your conscience. And so you're sitting here and, and it, it could be decaying you, wearing you down, killing you. Because you sit here with a guilty conscience. What do we do? Well, John told us, the one who beheld Jesus and walked with him, and he said, if, if we confess our sins, the, the Greek word is homo legeo. Homo means the same. Legeo means to be logic. To, to be in agreement with God, that it was sin. And if we confess our sins, God's faithful and just to cleanse us and forgive us from all our unrighteousness. And we battled in Romans 3 where how can God forgive us and still be just? And because he wasn't just to his son, he can now forgive us. And now as believers, if he doesn't forgive us, he's not just. So the very character and foundation of God is how you can bank on my sin when I confess it. He's faithful and just to cleanse me from all my unrighteousness. And my conscience is cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Covered. Not guilty. Boom. Instant fellowship. Right back into that whole 1 John 1 is how to walk with him. How to have fellowship with one who's holy and perfect light and we're sinful. He says sinners can have fellowship with God. So this morning I want you to hear you can cleanse your conscience by going to God and agreeing and confessing what I've been doing is sin. God, will you forgive me? Will you cleanse me? And you receive his cleansing. Instead of saying, I'm going to go do six Hail Marys, three Our Fathers, and be better. That doesn't cleanse consciences. But the blood of Jesus does. So the, the glory this morning is you can reset your conscience. You, whatever guilt, shame you're sitting here with this morning, there's a way to heal it. Praise be to God. So we're growing and teaching our conscience to work right. We're trying to learn in Romans 14 how to let it work right. And we're just informing and we're talking with each other and we're growing. And we all just want a clear conscience before God because he says, you're going to stand before me in judgment for all that we approved and disapproved. So I, I just want a clear conscience before God of how I live my life out for him. And when I cross it, I don't want to sear my conscience. And the most dangerous thing you can do is just keep ignoring it and suppressing it. It's, it's like putting a Band-Aid over, you know, your oil thing on your, your dashboard. I did that. I did that. It doesn't, it's not good. <laughs> and you can do the same thing in your Christian life. Conscience is working. Put a Band-Aid over it. Just stay in your sin. Just keep walking. And what you're doing is you're just hurting it. So I'm running out of time, but the conscience is such a gift from God. And, and my most favorite thing is I, I can reset it. I can cleanse and be restored. And be, so don't ignore God. Don't run from him. Don't make lies up. Come before him in truth and confess what you've been doing, what you've been saying, who you are, and be forgiven and brought back into that sweet, beautiful relationship because of Jesus Christ shed his blood. And I love that God is just he has to forgive you now because he didn't forgive his son. I can bank my forgiveness on the justice of God that cannot change. Get you excited? <laughs> it does for me. If you're not a big sinner, it doesn't mean much to you. But for me, this is the best news I've ever heard. This freedom and blessing. He says, blessed are you then to be pleasing to God and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's freedom. And the other brings shame and guilt and a million ways of trying to get rid of it. Praise be to God for Jesus Christ who cleanses our conscience from all guilt. Conclusion in verse 23. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith and whatever is not from faith is sin. Wait a minute, Paul. You just said all things are clean. These are all moral issues. That's what we've been working through. Christian freedoms, you, you can eat or not eat. You can drink or not drink. And it's sanctified by giving thanks to God. Thank you, Lord, for this. And you're doing it from a good heart. <clears throat> and now he has to go and drop this little word, sin. 
And the whole argument, I hope that takes your breath away. I didn't see that coming, did you? I did not see that coming. We know that, that what your conviction on wine is, Paul, I think you had too much when you wrote this. That's, that's cheap. <laughs> but look at this. He who doubts, if he does it, is condemned because it's sin. And if you're not fully convinced what he's now going to close with, get convinced. And if you are not, don't do it. The word for doubt is the same word in James 1.6. James says, let him ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Don't doubt and go all over. The conscience is the last thing left in man if he squanders all else. It's the last chain left to God. And if you sear it, the sky is the limit for the sin and debauchery that you will engage in. You will not recognize yourself five years down the road or even three months. It's dangerous. Treasure this gift that God has given to you to maintain a good conscience before God and man. So I want you to hear this. Don't encourage a brother or sister to go against their conscience. To not get truth and pray and consider and study it beforehand to try to calibrate it. So as the body of Christ, if someone says, hey, what's your conviction on Christmas? You want to know? Let's sit down. And I'm not going to try to just get them to put up a Christmas tree so I feel better about myself. I'm going to try to share my journey in truth and the outwork into the fruit and what I've seen, I'm going to try to lead them into that. And so that's the beauty of the body. When people ask, that's good. When they don't ask, because when you violate it, you're rubbing the edges off every time. And it just gets easier and easier to sin until what you are approving and doing will shock even you. So your conscience It's a big deal to ignore it and to shut it up and to just keep moving. The application is to pray that God would forgive you and make you sensitive again to the Holy Spirit and to your conscience to help you to obey it. Again, this could be a place of real healing this morning if you've been putting the Band-Aid over your conscience. So we have a remedy. We've got a beautiful remedy in Jesus Christ. And I love this statement. I've spent a lot of time on this one. Whatever is not of faith is sin. So here, the south side, you have food that is clean, but you could eat that food and it could be sin if it's not done in faith. Because your conscience is saying, no, that's wrong. Don't eat it. So my question to you this morning, and you can yell it out if you want, why would you do it then? You already have a conviction. Your conscience is saying no. Why would you do it? Nobody's going to yell it out. Oh, louder. Fear of man. man. It's not by faith. That's such a good answer. It's peer pressure. It's peer pressure. And then all of a sudden, you're more worried about the peer pressure and what people are thinking, or you're just even lower. I just want pleasure. It doesn't matter what I've concluded, what I think. I just want that beer, being lazy. So, pastor, help me flesh this out. This is confusing. It's been so clear, and now you're confusing me on the last verse. Go back to verse 14. I know and I'm convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. But to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Uncleanness is not in the food or drink, but in your motive and in your conscience. The only way to make it unclean is to do it not by faith. So what is faith? That's all we've been learning in Romans. Faith to rest and trust in Jesus. It's, It's really to find your all in all in Jesus Christ. Faith is I see who he is and what he is. And now I I just, everything I look for Jesus. You believe in him. The just shall live by faith. You live into him in all the fullness. So to act on these issues now, not out of trust and satisfaction in Jesus Christ, but peer pressure or just simple pleasure is sin. He now takes it into that realm. You've done such a good job. You've you've been studying and thinking on the issue. You said, I want to please you, God. What should I do on this? You want to love your brother You want to obey conscience to be blessed in Christ and enjoy him. And now all of a sudden, 
You would, you would never go against your conscience if you're resting in Christ. You did all your homework. You did such a good job. And now the moment of truth comes and you throw it all away and you go do it. You don't need others' approval. Paul said, I wouldn't be a bondservant of Jesus Christ if I was trying to serve men. You don't need that pleasure in food or drink. Do you, do you really think that, that bottle of wine is going to mean more to you than communion and fellowship with Jesus Christ? You have faith. And Paul says, whatever is not of faith then is sin. It's sin to act against your conscience. It's not faith to be satisfied in him alone and follow his voice alone. My conscience has been taken up in this passage. It's been informed. My love for my brothers was taken second seat in some of my convictions to my shame. My mind has understood what the will of God is, what's good and pleasing to him. It's all I want to do is offer up my body a living sacrifice. And now to act against my informed and taught conscience on these issues is sin. Because it's not a faith. Other pressures or truths are what are guiding you, not your sweet faith in Jesus Christ. You're making a snap decision against your conscience because you're not living by faith in Jesus Christ. Isn't that powerful? Wow. To God be the glory in the church. May we receive one another on these issues into our intimate fellowship. May we care about the work of God in each other. Will we not tear it down by my freedoms? But will we build it up? And by being informed in the word of God, may we be blessed in what we approve and what we walk in with a clear conscience. And never act contrary to faith and sin against our conscience and thus against our God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For that is what the kingdom of God is about. So as we close, I just ask you again, is this what you're about? Young, young kids, is this what you're about? Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Singles, is this what you're about? Marrieds, families, Nikes, all this church. Is this what we're about? And Paul just brings it all, all together and says, don't get off on all the lesser things. Make it this. Make that our unity and run together after this. And don't spend your time on all the lesser things. To God be the glory in his church. Father, I pray that you work in each one of our hearts. Lord, I, I thank you for the beauty of what you're doing in my own heart. God, thank you for the law of Christ that has a therefore by the mercies of God. Lord, Jesus is altogether lovely. And when we stare at him, there's righteousness. <laughs> righteousness that wells up in our hearts to go walk and live as he did. There is peace with God and there's peace with each other. And peace of mind, God, thank you. And joy in the Holy Spirit, no matter what we're facing this morning, the Holy Spirit can lead us to joy. Oh God, let us do that work, Holy Spirit, in every mind and heart this morning as they believe. Please, let them gaze on Jesus for whatever weights and burdens are just weighing them down. Let them look their eyes out at Jesus and find that peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. God, thank you for this section that Paul gave to us. Transform and change every one of us to be these kind of men, women, and children at Southside Bible Church. We thank you and we love you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.